isn't just us, it's the Class A members, the Class B members, Class C members. They own this place, they own Basin Electric, they're, they're part of Basin Electric. There's always a, uh, a goal in mind as far as we're trying to reach. Have a discussion of like where, where can we move or how can we get more flexibility if it's possible. I think working together is, is critical, particularly when you go through change in any work environment. I'm a part of cost savings and I want to play my part. So if you got great people, you can make a lot of great things happen. know what we're working for and um, we're doing it together. There's challenges every day but uh, we get through them. When things go right everybody's happier but where we're fortunate is when they don't go right people pull together and figure out what's wrong. People are willing to step up to that. They know that there's a new normal. Our whole crew comes up with different ideas on how to make. We're always working on how to make a job more efficient and get it done. What is my role? What role do I play in Basin? And how do I contribute? You know, change is inevitable. I mean, it's whether we like it or not, it's, I mean, we have no control over it. We gotta try to make the best of it, stay focused, keep our eyes in the game, keep our mind on task. Help the members out, help them plan out, help Basin out. Know that Paul, um, the entire membership team, everyone has the same goal in mind. To operate these units as efficiently as we can to provide the least expensive power to the end of the line users. The commitment of Basin to provide power for a long period of time. We're, we're not going anywhere. We are here for the long run. It means working together and getting the job done and being safe. Good morning, everyone. I'm Wayne Peltier, president of the board, and uh, I represent District 9 on the Basin Electric Board. It is my pleasure today to begin by um, inviting Governor Doug Bergen up to welcome you to the great state of North Dakota. Governor? Good morning. It's great to be here with all of you and uh, thank you for that introduction, Wayne. Uh, great organizations always begin with great leadership and I want to thank Board President Wayne Peltier and CEO Paul Sukit for, for their great leadership. I want to thank all of you that have come here from uh, across the uh, country. Let's show a show of hands. How many here from Minnesota? Way to go. Glad you came over. Uh, go Vikings. Montana. Nebraska, New Mexico, got some that came up that far. South Dakota, oh look at that. Any of you go to the uh, S any of you go to the SDSU game? Because I sure enjoyed it. That was <coughs> a lot of fun. Uh, Wyoming, anybody here from Wyoming? All right, you stole one of our coaches. That's okay. Uh, but anyway, how about from North Dakota? Let's hear it. Who's here from North Dakota? All right. Anyway, well, you got a, uh, did I miss Nebraska? I'm sorry, you guys are having a tough year this year. I don't mean to leave you out. And Iowa too, we got Iowa right over here. Nice work, good to have you here. Okay, and uh, and, and Minnesota, I mean, wow, you got undefeated, that's amazing. Uh, and you got next weekend, I guess, playing somebody else who's undefeated, that'll be exciting. But listen, you were here to talk more than about football uh, or hunting or fall blizzards or floods. Uh, I want to begin uh, with gratitude and I want to thank all of you. Uh, show of hands if you're a director of one of the, one of the Basin Electric uh, local rural co-ops. Show of hands. Because uh, I especially want to thank you uh, 
I got a personal connection. I grew up in Arthur, North Dakota, in the eastern part of the state. It's about uh, 350 people if we count the 100 people that live in the Good Samaritan home, which we do uh, count them. Uh, but, you know, small town. And when, uh, w when I was uh, uh, growing up there as a kid, uh, if you go back to the earlier part in the 1906, my grandparents, my grandmother and grandfather started the grain elevator there. Uh, in 1906, in 1915, uh, they helped bring electricity to the the area, the small area, a couple towns around Arthur and Hunter, North Dakota. And so the grain elevator, which was a privately held family-owned business, was also the electrical provider from 1915 up until the early 1960s. And, and so this was, uh, helps me understand on a couple levels. One, the understands the, you know, from a direct family perspective of, of the, the mission that our family business had in making sure that the, the anybody in our area, whether they were a you know ag producer, crops or livestock, whatever, small dairy farmers, as it was back in the 50s and 60s, that understood that whether it was the safety of their family or the continuation of their operation, that rural electrification was one of the things that kept them going. Uh, also, it was one of the things that terrified my mother because I had a bunch of guys that were farmers and grain elevator guys and every time there was a blizzard and there was a down line somewhere in their system then my dad would say well I got we got to go out there and uh, go try to find the line in a blizzard and my mom was certain that every time so basically as a young kid you know being early anytime it snowed my mom thought my dad was going to get electrocuted that was sort of the pattern around the house uh, but the good news was that uh, he didn't and neither did the other guys that worked at the elevator that worked so hard to keep that power going and then in the 1960s they sold it to uh, the local co-op there Cass County Electric of which is still part of but I got this direct connection of understanding that rural electric co-ops you know really have made a difference in the last century in building our country and supporting the communities and the families that uh, that have helped uh, <clears throat> really deliver both the energy and the food not just for our country but for the the whole world and I think that it's a you know really a credit to the 141 member co-ops uh, to all of you and all of you that take the time in addition to likely being a, a, a producer uh, in your community uh, but also taking the time to serve on the board so I just want to say uh, thank you to all the directors that are here today thanks for your service and thanks for coming to the annual meeting here in North Dakota let's give it up for the uh... <laughs> In North Dakota, we really reflect what Basin has done as a strategy. We've taken an all of above energy approach, uh, as I know B Basin has. You got a great mix of power, and you know whether it's uh, you know coal. Uh, you've really taken advantage of wind, and here in North Dakota, you've done that: natural gas, hydroelectric, uh, nuclear. Your distribution, your renewable energy efforts. Uh, and North Dakota, the same way in doing that, has taken this all of the above approach. And now we're the number six energy producer out of all the states in the nation overall. And uh, even though we're 47th in population, we're number six in energy production. And as everybody knows, we're number two in oil production, only behind uh, Texas. We sent a new record last month of 1.5 million uh, barrels per day. Uh, and we're on our way towards 2 million barrels a day. And this is a this is important, not just in North Dakota, not just for Basin Electric and its members, but it's important uh, to you. Uh, if you're an American, it's important to you if you've known anybody in your family or a community that's ever put on a uniform uh, any time, including World War II. Uh, World War II was fought over energy resources uh, by two, you know, Japan and Germany, both wanting to expand their, their sphere of control because they didn't have the resources, either the food or the energy resources to control their ambitions and or fuel their ambitions. And so with this, this world's been fighting about energy uh, really for the last uh, 70 years and 80 years. And now we're in a spot where uh, because of what's going on in the revolution of energy, in the all of above energy in the United States and supporting the entire mix. If we can support the entire mix the way uh, this administration has the last three years, we're in a position where we can have be participating, all of you can participate in the biggest geopolitical shift uh, in your lifetimes, uh, in your children's lifetimes, your grandchildren's lifetime, and that, that shift is that we're gonna be able to start selling energy to our friends and allies versus buying it from our enemies. And when we can start selling energy to our friends and allies versus buying it from our enemies, that, uh, you know, that can put a, an opportunity for us to think about uh, whether you want to call it a peace dividend, whether you want to call it a, uh, 
uh, an energy dividend, what do you want to call it, the trillion dollars that Americans save because of low taxes on gasoline at the pump. Uh, that dividend is, is uh, significant and huge, and it's one of the things that's fueling uh, the growth in the workforce and the low unemployment in our economy today. Uh, because uh, if you want to know what not just energy independence or what energy dominance, but you know, energy security looks like, you know, then imagine that you have a swarm of drones that come flying across the desert and take out 5% of the world's refining capacity, and the price of gas in any of the states that are represented here didn't move didn't move a lick at the pump, which that happened last month. Uh, you know, it doesn't even make you know it doesn't even make the head front page maybe for a day. Uh, that would have been a that would have caused a, you know a huge spike uh, in energy prices uh, as recently as 10 years ago. Uh, if you if our country wanted to put sanctions on uh, Iran uh, and their and the role they played in OPEC or the role they play in OPEC, that would have caused a huge spike in energy prices in our country. Both of those things have happened. Iranian sanctions barely makes the front page. Five percent of the world Frank Cassidy gone barely makes the front page. It's like headlines for a day, and price doesn't change here. That's what energy security looks like. That's what we do when. That's what it looks like when the U.S. is moving to become the world's largest energy producer and and on its way to becoming the world's largest exporter. Again, exporting to our friends versus buying from our enemies. Uh, just to give you a sense of what that could mean, Japan, uh, I've had a chance to meet with the ambassador of Japan a couple times, uh, talk about energy. They have 128 million people, which is more than in your entire uh, basin area, but they have 128 million people that occupy a space the size almost exactly of North and South Dakota together. So 128 million people in the size of the Dakotas, and their, their oil production is 4,000 barrels a day. In Japan, there's there's ranchers in North Dakota that have you know one well in their their you know on their place that's producing more than that. And where does in Japan get their energy? They get it through mostly shipped in uh, from the Middle East through the South China Sea. You imagine that that's the opposite of energy security. They don't produce enough food to feed feed all the people they have. <clears throat> so we've got allies like Japan that want to buy what we have, and yet we've got people in our country that are trying to stop. Uh, base load energy production. They're they're saying that we've got some sources of energy of energy that uh, you know basically should be made illegal, and there are one billion people out of seven billion people on this planet. One billion people on this planet that get up every day, and there's no electricity in their home, not because they live in California and the power's been shut off, but because they live in a part of the world that has not yet been electrified. They are uh, more than 100 years. They are like the pioneers that settled in the Great Plains and in this, in this service area that Basin has uh, that had their lives changed when electricity came and allowed the prosperity that we've seen in this part of the world in the last century. And, and I guess, uh, <clears throat> you know, from the way I look at it, having studied this, I know that the U.S. produces energy cleaner and more efficiently and safer than any other place in the world. You saw it on the, your opening video here in some of your own operations. And if, and if someone is saying, hey, we should act locally and think globally, which is a phrase you hear a lot, well, if you, wanna, if you wanna think locally and act globally, then the U.S. should produce as much energy as we can for the entire world because we do it cleaner, safer, more effectively, more efficiently than anybody else. If we stop producing energy in the U.S., including stop producing baseload electricity, you know what's going to be built around the world? You know what's being built right now in China and India? People are building power plants with 1970s coal technology. And with R&D, we have an opportunity to really transform how we think about how we think about even uh, the producing a baseload. And, and I'm confident, at least what we're trying to drive in our state, is that the approach to solve the world's energy problems over the next 20, 30, 40 years is with innovation, not regulation. Regulating things uh, just doesn't work. I come from a background in both agriculture but also technology. I came from an industry uh, where, uh, you know, the five leading companies in that industry were investing $70 billion a year in technology, and that's why every one of you has likely got a supercomputer in your pocket that you were able to buy for a couple hundred bucks. It's not a phone, it's not a smartphone, it's a supercomputer with capabilities that you're only only beginning to, to be able to develop, and that, that device in your pocket is going to get 
you know, double in power every 18 months and drop in price as capability, or may not drop in price, but they'll add more capability and more capability just as they are right now. And, and that's what can happen in this industry if we allow innovation to happen. Regulation is the killer of innovation. And so in North Dakota, we've been trying to really push that. We've invested over $96 million in energy research and development uh, where we're partnering with state R&D dollars to partner with the private sector. And this includes a number of exciting projects, whether it's Hanson Royal Recovery, underground storage of produced natural gas, uh, different approaches for remediation, and of course, carbon capture utilization and storage. Uh, I've got some younger children, like I'm sure of, many of you do. When I grew up, you know, <clears throat> Growing up in the uh, ag community, carbon was a good thing. Carbon was necessary to help plants grow. Today, you talk to somebody under 20, and carbon is the you know the devil element on on any uh, on any chart. And and we know that uh, there's that that at least I believe that with innovation and investment in R and D, that we can be in a position where carbon once again can take a spot where it's going to be a value added input as opposed to a uh, something that is a, a cost center, it can become a revenue center, or at least revenue neutral. And, and some of that uh, we know is going to be solved through research. We did, we got some good news in September, Department of Energy announced a $9.8 million front end engineering design project for Project Tundra, which comes on top of $15 million that our state industrial commission, which I have an opportunity to chair, uh, uh, voted to approve last year. So again, investing in innovation to help solve these problems. You know, all the states that are here have got huge ag um, operations, and I know that in any one of those states, if you go into a grocery store in the wintertime and you want to buy blueberries, it probably got, they probably got, you know, were grown in Costa Rica or Chile and shipped up here uh, at great transportation costs. We have an opportunity by adding, you know, greenhouses near our facilities, taking that extra carbon, putting it in the greenhouses to be someone who's producing food year round. Iceland's doing this with geothermal. The Netherlands has actually become an exporter of food, little country of Netherlands. They got a teeny fraction of the land mass of any one of the states that are represented here and they're a food exporter uh, because of what they've been able to do with greenhouses and we know that you can increase production, you know, 30, 40% with enhanced carbon environments in those greenhouses. So there's, there is an innovative path forward here and it can involve collaboration between energy and agriculture. Uh, <clears throat> And, and but right as we as we drive that one of the things we do know one of the things that's driving this energy revolution is the technology and the private sector companies that are investing in the Bakken uh, here in North Dakota and we know that there's going to be a tremendous we know that uh, talking to Dale this morning we know there's demand load across the entire basin portfolio we know that it's you know driven by population increases uh, you know enhanced value added uh, agricultural efforts that are going on whether it's uh, uh, confinement agriculture or whether it's uh, value-added processing plants but in the Bakken the, 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 the recent recent uh, report that just came out from our transmission authority said that there's an expectation that we're going to need a uh, thousand megawatts in North Dakota over the next 10 years or, or 100 megawatts a year and and we need to meet that just to meet the demand that's coming within within the Bakken right now and that excludes uh, the the likely possibility that in the Bakken there will be built a large petrochem value-added facility sometime in that time frame. And I say, why is that likely? It's likely because the Bakken's just not a fantastic producer of, of oil, which it is. <clears throat> The Bakken, uh, during the time frame when we went from 700,000 barrels a day to 1.5 million barrels a day, as we did that, the gas to oil ratio doubled. So when we doubled the amount of gas, we, caught, we doubled the amount of oil, doubled the amount of oil, 700,000 to 1.4 million barrels a day, we quadrupled the amount of gas. Quadrupled the gas when we doubled the oil. And so with that extra gas, uh, North Dakota is chasing what some people call a flaring a challenge, I, I'd like to say it's a flaring opportunity because that means we've got low cost energy source and that energy source, the, the richness of that gas, 52.5% ethane, uh, is got a fantastic mix and that ethane of course is what drives polyethylene which is what drives plastic and there's going to be a thousand new uses for plastics invented in this planet on everything from um, 
from road surfacing uh, to lower cost materials that will reduce transportation costs. So again, if you, if you care about the environment, then you would care about, you know, trying to use advancements in plastics to replace, uh, you know, steel or iron for products uh, because, you know, lighter weight, lower cost is going to save the world energy. So, so polyethylene has got a, and, and has an intre incredible future. And, and to build one of those, it's about a $10 billion capital investment. There's only a few companies in the world that would do that, but when they look at what they would need to do that, they need to have water, they need to have rail, they need to have underground uh, geologic storage for stadium-sized uh, places to store uh, the propane, the butane, the ethane, and the other byproducts that come off of these processes. Uh, they need to have labor force, they need to have transmission, uh, and they need, they need to have you know, willing uh, and innovative partners. And all of these things exist in North Dakota. And many of those things that I've described uh, are held by Basin Electric and by its member co-ops that work here in the Bakken. So there is a huge opportunity for this organization to be a participant in helping lay the groundwork uh, to have that kind of investment here. If not, it'll end up going someplace else in the world, like the Gulf Coast. Uh, and then, uh, and then w whatever, uh, you know, where we're in, we're always in a spot, whether you're in the ag business or the electric business. If you're a long way from where people are consuming, you know, those of us that are in the distant areas that are producers, you know, we end up either having a, you know, a large basis or high transportation costs or, or both. Uh, in a way where we end up being disadvantaged. The way that all of us win is if we do more value added close to the source. And this is a big opportunity for us and we look forward to continuing to work with, with Basin uh, to do that. But anyway, in closing, I just wanna say, you know, we've got an opportunity here to use common sense uh, regulations. We've got an opportunity to encourage innovation. We have a chance to work together and collaborate between the private sector and the public sector uh, to continue to transform, advance, and innovate uh, this industry. And I just want to say uh, a special, you know, thank you uh, to all of you, all the directors that are here, all the people that work uh, for your important role in producing. Um, you know, producing the power that helps power our country uh, because the states that are represented here uh, have been, this is part of the group that's been transformational. The work that's done by your people on your teams that are out there, the linemen, the people that are going out in the blizzards helping every farmer, every rancher get their work done like they've been doing for 100 years. This is, this is, the, this is the group that's making a difference and we can, we can literally right here in this part of the country show the world how it gets done, how we can have clean, clean, efficient, effective, low cost power that allows uh, families to be healthy, allows communities to prosper, uh, allows everyone to reach their fullest potential. And so there's a, th this is where it all begins right here. You guys are playing an important role. Thank you, for, thank you for taking your time to serve on these local boards. Thanks to everybody that's out there making it work. And thanks to Basin for being such a great partner with the state of North Dakota. We look forward to continuing to work with you as we uh, move, move this area and, and North Dakota and the nation forward. So thank you and have a great conference. Thanks for coming to North Dakota. Appreciate it.